So today we're going to talk about the first angel's message, and specifically the historical background to it. God will be God. He can be no one else. He must be God, and his character demands that he acts and that he reacts in a manner that is consistent with his character. Now there's a principle that I want to discuss as we begin, and it's called the full cup principle, or at least that's what I call it. The full cup principle. And this concept is simply that God does not bring destruction upon a people until their cup of iniquity and sin is full. And they, at the same time, have had an opportunity to be warned of coming destruction and to repent. God told Abraham concerning his prosperity that they were going into Egyptian bondage. And he said in Genesis 15, 16. He says, But in the fourth generation they shall come thither again for or because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. There was going to come a time when the iniquity of the Amorites was going to be full. And at that point, God was going to bring his people out of Egypt. And they were going to go in and possess that land, and they were going to dispossess the Amorites. A destruction was going to come for the Amorites. But it wasn't yet to happen because their uh, cup of iniquity was not yet full. God was going to give to Israel the land where the Amorites were staying. But again, their cup of iniquity was not yet full, and would not be full until the time of their fourth generation. And this is an example of the full cup principle concerning a nation. Concerning a nation. But there's also an illustration of this for the world. And that is during the time of Noah. Remember Noah was a preacher of righteousness? And God inspired that preacher of righteousness to warn the antediluvian people for how long? 120 years. 120 years they had a warning. You know, there were people who, in 1944, began to give up on the Advent movement because they said, you know, we've been around for 100 years. And surely we made a mistake. God must not be in this. But God warned these antediluvian people for 120 years. Sodom and Gomorrah. They are cities that illustrate the full cup principle. Before destroying Sodom and Gomorrah, God used Lot to warn any who would heed the message of coming destruction. He sent angels there to try to take out any who would listen. In the year AD 70, the destruction of Jerusalem occurred. But before that, God gave warning upon warning, beginning with the ministry of Jesus Christ. This world is again slated for destruction because its cup of iniquity, friends, is almost full. And if you don't believe that, just look at the news. Look at the news of of the sin that is now out of the closet and and in the open. Look at the destruction that is coming upon cities and, and, and areas telling us these catastrophes that Jesus spoke of are coming with great rapidity, and they are here um, among us at this time. God has a warning. God has a warning for this world. And that warning is found in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 12. Let's read it. After speaking of the 144,000, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. And that's the first angel's message. And now we have the second. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she hath made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. I talked to a man one time, and he said, this man claims to be a preacher. Might be preaching today, someplace else, close by. And he said, you know, I, I don't preach second angel's message. 
He says, you know, if you just, if you just preach the truth about God, you'll bring about a separation. You don't need to worry about second angel's message. It sort of takes care of itself. But friends, if that's true, why did God put it in here? That's right. Why did He write Revelation chapter 18 and verse 4 if it's going to take care of itself? He put it in there because we needed it and we need to obey it Amen. and preach it. It's part of the Word that Paul told Timothy to preach the Word. Verse 8, And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And now the third angel, beginning in verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, who receiveth the mark of his name. Oh, we don't need to preach that. Let's not talk about the beast power. Let's not talk about the man of sin. Let's not talk about the leader of this great organization. We don't need to. That's what some would tell you. And then some would tell you that verse 12 isn't, listen to me, that verse 12 isn't a part of the three angels' messages. That's right. I heard that proclaimed in France by ministers. They said, oh, that's not part of the three angels' messages. Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And when we get to the third angel's message, we'll be reading many statements that says that this is part of the third angel's message. Don't ever be in confusion on that. This final message of mercy and warning invites people to accept the everlasting gospel and to keep the commandments of God and the faith <coughs> of Jesus. Friends, God has been planning for this final assault. He's been planning well. But Satan has also been planning his final series of assaults. You might find it interesting that in the year 1844, Charles Darwin wrote his first essay that would form the basis of his work, The Origin of the Species. This work would preclude God from existence, promote atheism, and remove the basis, friends, of all morality. Darwin, his supposed discoveries, gave the scientific support for the rendering of God as being unnecessary. In 1845, Karl Marx wrote his Communist Manifesto, a document that became the basis for millions believing that morality, in fact even billions, believing that morality are only prejudices of the uninformed. And yet at this same time, at this 1844-1845 period, God gave to the little flock a message of creation and its memorial as the root truth underlying worship. We are to worship Him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. And that is a direct link back to what commandment, friends? The fourth commandment of the Decalogue, the Sabbath commandment. The seventh day Sabbath. Not some lunar Sabbath, not Sunday observance, but the seventh day Sabbath. And we are told to worship Him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. As Darwinism, Marxism, Nihilism and soon-to-be Freudism were coming into preeminence with their anti-theological, sociological ideas. God was raising up a people with a message that, if received, would drive a death nail into these satanic philosophies. And the message of the first angel was to fear God and to worship Him as the Creator. Yet, friends, it was not just from the secular philosophical forces that Satan would attack. The rise of modern spiritualism with the Fox sisters in New York took place in 1848, just as the message was beginning to sound. At this time, neo-Gnosticism and pantheism were all brought in to new heights. Again and again, the message was to be given to fear God and to give glory to Him and to worship Him because... The hour of his judgment has come. 
the cup of the world is almost full. Amen. Judgment's going to come and God sends a message. It's interesting, as we look at the combined factors of what was happening historically in, in, in this 1844 era and time, shortly before the Advent movement, Satan inspired Joseph Smith to begin Mormonism. After the final atonement began in 1844, we find Catholicism and apostate Protestantism falling more deeply. Shortly after Adventism was beginning, the Jehovah Witnesses and the Christian science religions were founded. You see, these religions with Mormonism, they're sort of non-Trinitarian, quasi-Christian kind of organizations. Some have prophets. Some claim to keep the commandments of God. And we see at this time the rise of Pentecostalism and the beginnings of the ecumenical movement. As the 20th century begins to fade away today, we see again the rise of Islam as a world power which is to be reckoned with. And again, God's answers to these false apostate views is to fear Him, to give glory to Him, and to worship Him as the Creator, to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In these last days, beloved, every false planting of Satan has sprouted and is becoming completely ripe. God's people will have the everlasting gospel, though, a message that will be fully developed to use as their weapon to destroy the works of Satan. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he says that, you know, we are to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and we are to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And the weapons of our warfare, Paul says, are not carnal, but they are mighty to the pulling down these war, these, these strongholds, these fortresses. And we have the sword, the, the word of God, which is powerful to do this with. Now, the goal of this study is the investigation. The goal of this series will be the investigation of this message, and particularly this morning, its history and background. And we'll be looking at its purpose, its work, its fruit, and all that hopefully is involved in a major way. In the book Life Sketches, on page 196, we find this. In reviewing our past history, having traveled over every step of advance to our present standing, I can say, praise God, for I see what the Lord has wrought. I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. We have nothing to fear for the future except we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and His teaching in our past history. Two things. The way God has led us. The way God has led us. Do you believe God's led his people? Yeah. I do. I think he's led us greatly. And he wants us, friends, to understand that. I was almost never so appalled. That's when I was sitting in the Andrews University Chapel one time. And Woodrow Whitten called our pioneers theological crackpots. Those are the exact words. Theological crackpots. Because they didn't believe in the Trinity. They became theological crackpots. I believe God led those men. Amen. They were great men. They were giants in the Bible. And she says, we have nothing to fear except we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and His teaching, His teaching in our past history. And Ellen White was so, so firm of this past teaching, so firm in it, that in 1881, in volume 4 of the Testimonies, on page 595, I don't have the slide for it, but she says, it is as certain that God lives, as, it is as certain that we have the truth as that God lives. That's pretty certain, isn't it? In Deuteronomy chapter 29, and verse 29, it says, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. We don't know everything, and we may never know everything, friends, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children, how long? Forever. 
forever. God has revealed many things. Sometimes we use the first part of this verse to say, oh, that's a secret. We don't know. God's got the secret things. And He does, some things. But there are things that have been revealed. And they are to us and to our children. They were to our advanced pioneers and to their children and to their descendants, their spiritual people that are us. Now, the secrets belong to God. But friends, again, He has shared some of His plans. And when He does share, He shares through His servants, the prophets. In Amos chapter 3, in verse 7, it says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but He revealeth His secret unto His servants, the prophets. Amen. So when God's going to bring coming judgment, what does He do? He sends prophets to reveal these things so that people can be warned and people can flee destruction and come into the everlasting arms of Christ where there's safety and security, friends. That's what we need today. When God's plans involve men or women or He calls for their involvement, He reveals His secrets to the prophets so that men and women may know what is expected of them and how we are to respond properly. Faithful men and women arise not by chance, beloved, but rather by God's calling and in God's time and in His manner and in His bidding. Amen. Amen. The exodus from Egypt was foretold to Abraham hundreds of years before. We read part of this, but let's go in Genesis 15, verses 13 through 16. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, Thou shalt be buried in good old age, but in the fourth generation they shall come thither again. So God had a plan. And it was a long-range plan. It wasn't anything happening that was going to take God by surprise. And friends, in your life today, things take us by surprise. Things happen that we don't expect at all. But be assured, it does not take God by surprise. When things happen to us, God is not uninformed, friends. He's there, and He's been planning maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of years for this very day. And He has a plan just for you at that time. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen noted, Acts seven seventeen, But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. He says that God swore this to Abraham. And friends, when God swears something, he never goes back on it. He is firm to his convictions and to his statements. His word is true. And so there was, drawing near a time, the way was being prepared for the children of Israel's deliverance from Egypt. This time schedule was controlled by the author of all time. And God saw the bondage of his people. He heard their cry and he knew of their sorrows, friends. In Exodus chapter 3, and verse 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Do you think God hears the cries of His people today? Yes. Yes. Is His ear changed? Is it no. you know, any shorter that He can't hear? The Bible says God does not change. And He hears our afflictions today. And He has a plan today to deliver us from this Egyptian bondage of sin. And He's promised to do it. The time of their deliverance had come and God prepared a man who was schooled in leadership, in the matters of the nation, in military warfare, a man, more importantly, with whom God could commune and could share direct instruction for His people. That's what God had prepared. And Moses was ready for the hour of deliverance. And when that hour came... God was ready. God was ready. Now the Apostle Paul, when he was preaching before Felix one time, in Acts chapter 24 and verse 25, it says that he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and something else. What is that last thing? He was to reason of judgment to come. In the day of Paul, those apostolic days, 
They didn't believe that when a person died, they immediately went to heaven or hell because they were somehow judged at death or judged already. Paul knew that judgment was something future. Something that was going to come in another day. And Daniel had foretold a time when this judgment would begin. In Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Daniel says, after seeing some of these great beasts that had rose out of the sea in Daniel 7, he says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down or placed, as the margin says, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow and the hairs of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were open. After these four beasts arise up out of the sea, Daniel sees something happening. He's seeing the judgment hour seen. The Ancient of Days sets, and one like the Son of Man comes before the Ancient of Days. This judgment would begin with the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary in 1844. In Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14, and the 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. God laid out a prophetic timeline, beginning in 457 B.C. with the decree of Arxerxes, going down to the year 1844, the 2,300 days from the time of the decree until the beginning of the investigative judgment. But before this great event would take place, God would send signs in the earth and in the heavens. In Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. He says that there was a great earthquake. And these signs have been understood by Adventists as events that were happening just prior to 1844. For instance, the great Lisbon earthquake of November 1, 1755. And this earthquake appeared shortly before the time of the judgment. There was the dark day of May 19, 1790, followed that night by the moon appearing as the color of blood. There was the great falling of the stars on November 13, 1833. All of these signs came at the time of the end of the transition from the dark ages to the time of the judgment. The time of the end that, that, that Daniel had prophesied of was, was coming to the end. We were at the threshold of this. The persecutions had stopped just shortly before the actual time of that end. And in 1755, God sent the Lisbon earthquake. And in 1833, the falling of the stars, just before the judgment begins. And it was at this time, with the signs being given on earth and heaven, that a man by the name of William Miller and others began to preach in earnest the first angel's message. William Miller had been an atheist. He had served as a lieutenant and captain in the War of 1812. After the war, he became a farmer, a local sheriff, and at times even a justice of the peace. But in 1816, he was converted from his, his atheistic ways and began to study the Bible in earnest. And I just want to share with you a little bit of what Miller said about his own experience. He says, I then devoted myself to prayer, and to the reading of the Word. I determined to lay aside all my presuppositions to thoroughly compare Scripture with Scripture and to pursue its study in a regular and methodical method. I commenced with Genesis and read verse by verse, proceeding no faster than the meaning of several passages should be so unfolded as to leave me free from embarrassment respecting any mysticism or contradictions. Wherever I found anything obscure, my practice was to compare it with all collateral passages and by the help of Cruden, Cruden's Concordance, I examined all the texts of Scripture in which were found any of the prominent words contained in an obscure portion. Then by letting every word have its proper bearing on the subject of the text, 
If my view of it harmonized with every collateral passage in the Bible, it ceased to be a difficulty. In this way, I pursued the study of the Bible in my first pursuit of it for about two years and was fully satisfied that it was its own interpreter. I found that by a comparison of Scripture with history, all the prophecies, so far as they had been fulfilled, had been fulfilled literally. That all the various figures, metaphors, parables, similitudes, etc. of the Bible were either explained in their immediate connection or the terms in which they were expressed were defined in other portions of the word and when thus explained are to be literally understood in accordance with such explanation. I was thus satisfied that the Bible is a system of revealed truths so clearly and simply given that the wayfaring man, though a fool, need not err therein. And that's what William Miller said. In 1831, 1831, Miller made a covenant with God that he would preach the first angel's message. He would preach about what he understood to be the coming judgment of the world and the coming of Christ. He covenanted with God to preach that if he was to get an invitation, if someone would invite him. Shortly after his covenant prayer, a young man knocked on his door with an invitation to preach in Dresden, New York. In 1833, Miller received a license to preach from the Baptist Church, and Miller was convinced by the prophecies that Jesus was going to come in either 1843 or 1844, and as he shared, people began to listen. Miller was a good preacher, but he was not a good promoter. <coughs> you get the difference? And so in December of 1839, he met Joshua Himes, who wasn't the greatest preacher, was a great promoter. Joshua Himes of Boston. And these two together worked fervently to spread the message of the Advent message. In 1840, Himes began to publish the Signs of the Times and the Expositor of Prophecy. And there you see one of the old editions there of it. Miller also became associated with Josiah Litch and Charles Fitch. Not related, their names just sound a little alike. Litch and Fitch. Each of these men had a part in helping to preach the great, the great awakening moment. Now Charles Fitch, whose picture we see here, had been greatly impressed by some verses in the book of Habakkuk. And these verses are in chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. And they state this, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Accordingly, Fitch made a large chart, and we call this today the 1843 chart. And this was published by Himes, that, and he used this to graphically illustrate the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Fitch also published a paper called The Second Advent of Christ, which had a wide circulation. Fitch wrote hymns. One, one hymn he wrote was called, One Precious Boon, O Lord, I Seek. <laughs> His central theme was preaching to prepare to meet thy God. It is said of Charles Fitch, Among all those in America who preached and taught the message of Jesus' coming, perhaps none were so widely and deeply loved as Charles Fitch. He just had such an abiding care for people. And I'd just like to share two incidences that give us some insight into the kind of person Fitch was and his determination to share the message of the soon coming Savior. During a meeting, while Fitch was giving an altar call in response to the message, one man was coming down the aisle and he tripped and fell down some steps on his way to the altar. Sadly, some of the people in the congregation began to laugh. But Fitch quickly squenched the laughter, by saying, in fact, these words were, Never mind, brother, it's better to stumble into heaven than walk straight into hell. Fitch's desire to minister to others led to his death. After baptizing a group during a cold day, he was returning from the water. Several more came and requested baptism. After repeating the solemn service in the cold and then beginning to return, Fitch was met by a third group requesting baptism. He, of course, was obligated and uh, even though he was too cold, too long, he performed the baptism. 
And as a result, he chilled and became very ill. He became worse. And on October the 11th of 1844, just 11 days prior to October 22, Fitch died, believing that in just a few hours, Jesus was coming. Fitch was also one of the first Advent preachers to preach the second angel's message. I look forward to meeting Charles Fitch. Now, Josiah Litch that we mentioned also, he was studying especially the fifth and sixth trumpets in Revelation. And he came to the conclusion, a conclusion as early as 1838, that the Ottoman Empire would fall in 1840. And according to his calculations, the Turks were to be overthrown sometime in the month of August in 1840. And a few days prior to its fulfillment, he wrote these words. Allowing the first period, 150 years, to have been exactly fulfilled before Decoz ascended the throne by permission of the Turks, and that the 391 years, 15 days, commenced at the close of the first period, it will end in the 11th of August, 1840, when the Ottoman power in Constantinople may be expected to be broken. And this, I believe, was found to be the case. Commenting upon this prophecy, Ellen White noted, at the very time specified, Turkey, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the Allied powers in Europe and thus placed herself under the control of Christian nations. The event exactly fulfilled the prediction. When it became known, multitudes were convinced of the correctness of the principles of prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates, and a wonderful impediment was given to the Advent movement. Men of learning and position united with Miller both in preaching and in publishing his views, and from 1840 to 1844, the work rapidly extended. Now, there were other notable persons who became involved in the Advent movement. And I could speak to you today about George Storrs, James White, Joseph Bates. In America, we could talk about Bengal and Kebler and others in Germany, the movement in Russia, Switzerland, Holland, and you can read about all these men in, in Great Controversy. You can read about Dr. Joseph Wolf and the travels he had, and how God raised up many people simultaneously throughout the world to preach the first angel's message and the coming judgment. The Advent movement, beloved, was clearly a worldwide movement which went to all the ends of the earth. It counted as its followers numerous believers and produced voluminous amounts of literature. And in early writings, Ellen White stated this. She said, I saw that God was in the proclamation of the time in 1843. It was his design to arouse the people and bring them to a testing point where they should decide for or against truth. Ministers were convinced of the correctness of the positions taken on the prophetic periods, and some renounced their pride and left their salaries and their churches to go forth from place to place to give the message. But, as the message from heaven could find a place in the hearts of but few of the professed ministers of Christ, the work was laid upon many who were not preachers. Some left their fields to sound the message, while others were called from their shops and their merchandise, and even some professional men were compelled to leave their professions to engage in the unpopular work of giving the first angel's message. And I think it's going to be a lot like that today. Even among those who profess to be God's remnant commandment-keeping people, there won't be many ministers who will really give the full first angel's message even fewer that will give the second angel's message. And it looks like there's even maybe going to be fewer who will be willing to give the third angel's message. And God may be calling people from professions, from shops, from merchandise, from many places to give the message, but I know one thing for sure. He's calling all of us to do something. He's calling all of us to do something. And as we continue in the next weeks to study this message, and this has just been the, the historical background, but it tells us, friends, that God has a plan. And he has a plan for, for cities. He has a plan for nations. He has a plan for this world. But more importantly for you, he has a plan for you. And that plan for you includes preparing you for the coming judgment and to be able to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator, an intercessor. 
And He wants to do that for you. He's provided everything we need in Jesus Christ. My God shall supply all your needs through Jesus Christ. In Him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In every problem that we think is taking us by surprise, God is there. And, and, and He is in control. And He is God. And He will not cease to be God. He will not abdicate His throne for anyone or anything. And so, beloved, I want to encourage you today to look to God, to trust in Him, and, and to cooperate with Him in this great work of preparation that we're going into right now. That we will be able to stand in that day. May God bless you lots and lots and lots.